So this is what the food buying guide does look like. And um, we get this question a lot. Um, you can find a copy of this book in um, CACFP if you go to the resource library. Schools, if you go to other documents, CACFP, it's under meal pattern requirements. And schools, yours is located under the food buying guide section. You can also get one online if you just type in food buying guide, it will pop up. Not only is it online, but you can also get a hard copy. Now, we have some hard copies here in our office, but I tell people all the time, if you ask us to mail them, we really won't. And the reason, here's the reason why is because this book we've had printed probably seven years ago and USDA is constantly updating this book. So really it's a PDF. You can go out there. We send one to someone when you start the program, but um, after that, it's all online. Again, it's interactive. You can get the hard copy. Um, if you go to the online or the app version, you can get it onto any um I have an iPhone, it's on my iPhone, we can put it on a tablet, and you can find the hard copy there as well. So they all look a little bit different. We're going to go through each one so you can see what it looks like, but they all give the exact same information. So what food items, this is why it is so important to have the food buying guide. It tells you what food items are allowed to be served in any of our child nutrition programs. And um, there is a little bit of differences between the school program and the daycare program, the CECFP, but it's really mostly to do with like sugar. We look at sugar in CECFP and we look at sodium and like sub um, vegetable subgroups in schools. So that's the only two things that are really different, but as far as the items you can serve for the most part, they are the same. I'm going to go through a, one other book that is more towards CAC of P on what you can and cannot serve, but really any program can use it. It's a great, I call it a cliff notes version of the food buying guide. The food buying guide also gives you the crediting information. So for instance, if you're looking up for cheese and you go to the milk section, you're not going to find cheese in the milk section because cheese on our program is considered a meat meat alternate. It also lets you know what vegetable would be in what vegetable subgroup. It lets you know how many servings you get from a specific quantity and the quantity of raw product will provide the amount when you cook it. So if you have something that's raw, it will let you know if you heat it up, how much serving size you will get out of it. So what is the food buying guide? It will help you buy the right amount of food and purchase it in the most cost effective manner. It will also in here, we have information we call it, they call this like the yield table, the yield data, but there are over 2,100 food items in here. So you have quite a variety of food items that you can serve um, on uh, any of the child nutrition programs. The food buying guide is also used by us. This is what we use to ensure that you are serving enough food. So the food buying guide is a very important document. Again, everything that we use for the review, we give you a copy so you can see it as well. The biggest thing I can tell people, they say, just look at the back of the can. Do not look at the back of the can. Again, the food buying guide takes into consideration if something's heated, if it's not heated, um, which the can item does not. So again, what it also does, but it's really cool, especially the app and the online version. So on the online version, you can create a username or login. I do not because I'm a state agency. I don't really need the information. So I go in as a guest, which you can also go in as a guest as well. But if you do have a username or login, and then if you use it on the phone, on the online version, the interactive and the app, you can compare food items. So maybe you're at the grocery store and you always buy 80-20, but then they're out of 80-20. So maybe you're thinking about buying 90-10 or 85-15. You can go to the app or online and you can compare the two to see which one you may wanna do. Um, you also can have a store or a list favorite. You can put your favorite food items in there, which is really cool. And then you can also on the app version and the online. So in the fruit and vegetable section um, on the hard copy, you can't change anything. But if you go to the app or online version, you can change the serving size of fruit or vegetable. A lot, everything in the food buying guide is in one fourth cup servings. Most school districts are going to serve a half a cup as the smallest that they're going to do. So they can go in there. You can change it from a fourth of a cup to the half of a cup and it's going to change. So instead of saying like you need 39.5 um, one fourth cup servings for that number 10 can, it will tell you how much it will give you of a half cup serving. So it's really cool. So you know precisely how much to open up. You can also do a recipe analysis. There's also talks about the USDA 
SEC and labeling program, and there's a lot of other resources in the appendix. So it's a really, really neat book. It gives a lot of information, but I will tell you when I first started on the program, that was the hardest thing for me to learn was the food buying guide. So I'm going to go into more detail and hopefully describe to you what it is the food buying guide is, kind of how to read it a little bit better, um, and give you some any inf other information that I can give. So again, it doesn't matter if you're feeding 10 people or 1,000 people, the concept of this book is still the same. So the information in the food buying guide, we talk about it's all about the label. Everything in the food buying guide has what we call a standard of identity. So I'm going to give you some examples of this, but when we talk about standard of identity, I'll talk more into depth about what that means. But in the food buying guide, if it's credible or not, if you can serve it. So there is an, a column in the food buying guide that's called the food as purchase column. It's called food as purchase. So if you go in there and you look under the food as purchase column and the item that you're wanting to serve on the label, it says exactly what it says in the food buying guide in that food as purchase column, then you can serve it on um, child nutrition, any of the child nutrition programs. If it is not in there, if it's not exactly as stated in the food as purchase column, you, you cannot serve it unless you have a CN label or a product formulation statement. If you do not have either of those, then you are not allowed to serve it on CECFP or on um, the National School Lunch Program and, or summer feeding. This is for all child nutrition. So again, it has to be in the food buying guide for you to be able to serve it. If it's not, then that's when you have to have a CN label or a product formulation statement. So as we mentioned, it's all about the label. It's about having a standard of identity. So one of the things, this is the version that is interactive. This is the online version. So if you type in food buying guide, it's going to pull up this version here. This is one of my favorite examples to pull out. So if you go into the food buying guide, you will see that you can find chicken a la king. So what that means is if, if you find something at the store that is labeled chicken a la king, it has what's called a standard of identity. So a standard of identity essentially is like USDA wrote a recipe and they call this recipe chicken a la king. And if a company makes this in Washington and Texas and in um, uh, Maine, wherever they, they make this in America, if they follow the same exact recipe per USDA, they're allowed to put chicken on the king on, on the label. If they do not follow it directly, if they change a little bit, if they change a couple of ingredients or add more of an ingredient or less of an ingredient, they're no longer allowed to call it chicken on the king. They have to rename it something else. But if you find it in the food buying guide, it means it has a standard of identity. It means this company followed a recipe by USDA in order to put that name on the label. Chicken Ella King is one of those items that is in the food buying guide. So if you find a product called Chicken Ella King, you can serve it. I just typed in Chicken Ella King and it pulled it up right here again, the online version. This is the food is purchase column here in the middle. That's where it's at in the online version, but it will tell you right here, it's a meat meat alternate. It's that's where the component is. So if you serve chicken a la king, I'm pretty sure chicken a la king has like a dumpling or something in it. I can't quite remember. It's been a long time or a noodle, even though it's in there, it is only located in the meat meat alternate section. So because it's in the meat meat alternate section, you can only count it as a meat meat alternate. Um, if there is any grain in it, you'll have to find something else because it's saying that the grain in it is not creditable for um, child nutrition. So it not only gives you the component, it tells you the category. So this is a chicken product. Again, it's the chicken a la king. And also it gives you information right here, which is fantastic. You don't actually don't have to click into it if you don't want to, but we're going to click into it. Um, you can open it up. And when you open it up, it looks a lot like a regular um, food buying guide. So the, the, the book food buying guide, it has the columns all listed at the top and they all go across vertically. Um, but if you go into the online or the app version, it, they, all go, they go down horizontally, but it's the same exact um, columns. So we have the meat component. It is under poultry, it's a chicken product. So it, what it says is chicken a la king, if you buy it by the pound, you get 2.3 servings per purchase unit. So if you serve, Three fourths cup serving, you get 1.3 ounces of cooked poultry. If you need a hundred servings of this, this is what this next uh, column says. If you need a hundred servings, you have to 
you need to open up 43.5 pounds of chicken a la king. So you can serve chicken a la king, but you have to serve a lot of it. And it only counts as the meat meat alternate. You'd still have to serve something else as the grain. So it may not be effective for you to do that. And then it also gives additional information and the footnotes are right here at the bottom. So there's always going to be footnotes in the book. The footnotes, there are, there are like 10 pages of footnotes. So you find the number and then go to the footnotes pages and you'll find what you need um, in the app. And then um, in the online version, it lists the footnotes for you so you don't have to hunt them down. So one other thing that we look at quite a bit is credible lunch meat. So lunch meat, and this is the lunch meat I'm talking about. You go to the grocery store and you buy lunch meat. Um, so here's the food is purchase column. And we have all these hams right here. You can also click on footnote and it will take you to the footnotes. But again, as you saw, if you click into it, um, it will open up the footnotes for you. So we have all these hams. And a big thing that we have is with lunch meat, especially people serving ham and turkey. So if you want to serve those, I'm going to give you some helpful hints and some things that we see quite a bit. So when it comes to lunch meat, we have all these meats in the food buying guide. Um, so I had a center send me this. They went to a store and I, it looks to me like they went to Sam's. They went over by the cheese in the meat section that's already pre-cut, um, pre-packaged. And they pulled this and they said, hey, does this meet the requirements? And I said, well, what in the food buying guide, what do you think it is? And they pulled, they gave me this one. They said, well, we think it's this one, the pork mild cured, fully cooked, chilled or frozen ham with natural juices, boiled without bone. So I looked at it. I only have the front here. I looked at the back as well, but I will tell you that this did not meet. It was not credible. And the reason why is because yes, it does say um, ham with natural juices. It says that right here in the back on the label. It did say pork as the first ingredient. Um, it is chilled. It says keep refrigerated. So this is chilled. It's not frozen. Um, and it, I, I would say it is fully cooked. It doesn't say it on the package, but nowhere on the package does it say it's mild cured and nowhere are we seeing anything that says boiled. So you do, it has to match the label exactly and we're, it doesn't. So I will tell you right now, because this is a big issue, is if you want to serve sandwiches, especially ham and turkey, what we are finding is, is if you go to the pre-sliced section over by the ham and the, and the meats, um, we don't find one that meets any re the requirements for USDA. Some may meet requirements, but you have to go to the deli section and we would say we, you have to have a copy of the label and then you need to show us in the food buying guide if it does meet. Now turkey, the only turkey that is allowed that we have found um, is if you buy a whole turkey and then bake it and slice it for sandwiches. Now you can find some CN labeled items. So if you can get anything CN labeled or like we have a lot of schools on today, if you get anything from USDA foods or commodities, um, you can use that. Anything from USDA foods works. If you have a vendor and can get anything CN labeled, it will need to have a CN label. What we're try trying to show you is there's really no credible um, especially in the pre-slice section, it's in the food buying guide because there everything can have its own standard of identity. The thing when it comes to ham and turkey, this I can this is why it is. So if you go into the ham and turkey section and you're looking at products, you can have ham that's injected with 10% water. You can have ham that is injected with 20% water. There's no standard. Those that are listed in the food buying guide have a standard of identity. And the people that are wanting to make the items, they don't want to follow that recipe. They're creating their own. So it doesn't have a standard. So if you do want to make sandwiches, we really highly suggest that you do either beef bologna, you can make homemade pimento, you can make homemade tuna, chicken, or egg, because you can tell us how, what is in there. You can also do grilled chicken cheese as long as you use the right amount and it's creditable cheese. One thing that you can find easily with, that does not need a CN label is it's called turkey ham. You can find the turkey ham. We've seen it at a lot of places at Walmart. You can find it. You can get it from vendors. Um, so you can find what's called turkey ham. Jenny O makes it. There could be other people, but I'm just aware of Jenny O's, but it's called turkey ham. And as you see here in the food, this is the food is purchased column for the, the hard copy for the, the, for the hard copy, the PDF, it says turkey ham, fully cooked children frozen. So if you get a pound of it, you'll get about 11.20 um, serving or servings out of the one pound and one pound is 16 ounces. So it does state if you have to cook, you have to serve about 1.4 servings to provide one ounces of cooked turkey. 
So it's considered a turkey. And I'll tell you, it's really good. Um, you may just check the label because there's one that's plain turkey ham and there's one that has 15% added ingredients. If you purchase the one with the 15% added ingredients, which it will state that on the label, you do have to serve more. But turkey ham is a good option if you wanna do sandwiches and you can find that at a lot of places. So I had another place that sent me a, a, this fish portions that did not have a CN label and they asked if it would work. So they sent me what they thought in the food buying guide. And again, it says seafood frozen fish portions. Um, and it said fried battered 45% fish, not from minced fish, two ounce portions. Well, it, this says beer battered Alaska cod. It doesn't say just fish portions. It does say cod on here. So that one doesn't work. We also have fried and battered, and this is beer battered. It does say par fried and not fried. Um, it, it did say, it did not say two ounce portions. We do have two ounce fillets, but not portions. Um, and again, this is with Alaskan white ale. None of that is in here. There's nothing that talks about 45% fish and not from minced fish. So I'm not seeing anything that doesn't say it's not from minced fish. So again, this product would not work without a CN label because it does not match exactly what it states in the food buying guide. Um, these are some items that we commonly see people serve that don't have a standard of identity. So if you want like a ravioli, barbecue beef and pork, if you want to make your own barbecue beef or barbecue pork, you can't buy it in a container that says barbecue beef, barbecue pork. That's what we're talking about. Um, you can make it yourself. You can cook the pork and then add barbecue sauce to it because you can tell us how much meat you had and how much barbecue sauce that you added. But you can't buy it together because it doesn't list the barbecue pork, barbecue beef is not in the food buying guide. If you buy cooked sausage patties, it's not in the food buying guide. If they're already pre-cooked, breakfast pizza, canned chili. There are some chilies in the food buying guide, but again, it has to match word for word. Most of the canned chili that you find, like let's just say Wolf brand, it will not be in there. Um, regular bologna, regular hot dogs are not in there, potato chips. Um, again, just make sure fish sticks, like we said, there's some fish portions in there. There are some fish sticks, but most likely the fish stick that you are serving is from minced fish and is not 45% meat from fish. So you have to make sure again that the label matches the food, what's in the food buying guide. If you do want to make some items um, that are pre-made, example like pizza, burrito, chicken, if there's anything that has items that are two or more, again, you can look in the food buying guide. There are some that are in there. But again, if the lay, if the if it does not match the label, then it you cannot serve it unless you have a CN label or a product formulation statement. If you're not familiar with what a CN label looks like, this is a copy of one. This is one that we have created to show you. Um, it has to have all this information and it has to be on the package or the box. You can't just um, go to the internet and be like, I bought this Tyson chicken strip from Walmart. Right now we are not finding any CN labels from Sam's, Costco, Restaurant Deep, any of those, we're not finding CN labels at, at this point. So if you do have something with a CN label, you more than likely will have to buy it from a vendor. And a vendor is someone like US Foods, Cisco, Benny Key, Tankersley, Mid-America, Guderian, any places like that that has a, a truck that delivers items to you. It has to have this border with the CN. Um, it does have to have the mill contribution statement. Again, the six digit number is listed right here. This number is what you would put on your production records or your menu is served form because we have to make sure we pulled the correct CN label because sometimes you could serve three different ch chicken nuggets in a year um, just based on availability, uh, preferences. Um, it does have to have, again, this food and nutrition service statement. It will have the CN. And then the month, this right here is the month and the year of it was approved by USDA. What happens is, is a company sends their product directly to USDA, USDA analyzes it and then sends it back to the company with the label of what they could put on there. If they change one tiny formulation with the product, they are not allowed to put that CN label on there anymore. They have to remove it and have their product reanalyzed. And it's it's pretty pricey for them to do that. That's why CN level products are more expensive. 
This is another example of a product on the box um, right here. Again, here's where that six digit number is. What people get confused about, this is the number you write on your menu as served or production records. The one here at the top of the box, that's the product number. That's how you order it. We don't need that number. We need the number right here in the box. That is what we go by. Um, USDA also has a website that can let us know if anything's expired or anything like that. Um, so we go by the CN number, not by your product number of how you order it. If you do you see in labels, we will we will take the original label. You can cut it out. You can staple it if you want. But as long as you have the original label, you can take a photocopy of the label. We'll, we'll accept a photograph. Um, we may have to look at invoices and receipts to be able to validate the product. If it's not visible and legible, then we can't accept it. I will say that last scene label I told I showed you, I'll show you again, it is, I don't know if I could accept it just because I can't really read that. Um, so make sure and I know it probably happened when we did the highlighter on it, but you just have to make sure it is legible and visible for us to be able to read it. Um, you get you if you're going to serve anything with a product formulation statement or a CN label, it has to be a current product formulation statement. And then with the CN label, again, it must be current and the exact product that you purchased. Um, I've been to several reviews in the past where I'd go out there and they would give me a, a, a CN label from 1999 when they were a family daycare homes provider and they've been a center for 10 years, but they kept all their CN labels. There are products that no longer exist. It has to be a product that you are currently using. And that's another thing that we look at receipts on is to make sure it's the correct item. Again, here's that website that we can make sure that it is a valid CN label because they do expire. There's no expiration date on the CN labels, but they do expire after five years. Now we have all seen some that were not on this list um, that have been expired, but you they still had product. So um, we have seen that before. Um, don't worry too much about that, but uh, it, we do, we will sometimes reference that that website. So if you're serving USDA foods commodities, these are for my school districts, USDA foods are allowed to be served on any child nutrition program. If it's a combination food item or an item that is not found in the food buying guide, print out the product information sheet. The main reason for the CN label or the product formulation statement and the product information sheet is to let you know what it credits as. So if you did have a chicken nugget and it, how do you know how to serve it if there's no CN label? How do you know how much to serve, how much meat, meat alternate's gonna give you and how much bread it's gonna give you? Um, so that is the purpose of it. So we had a lot of people that'd be like, oh, I served a CN, I served a chicken nugget with no CN label, but I gave them bread. I'm like, okay, you gave them bread, but how much meat, meat alternate did you serve them? And they're like, well, I don't know. That's because there's no CN label. We have to have that because you have, we have to know credit for both items, not just one for one. So now let's go into more about the food buying guide, how it looks, how to read it. Um, the food buying guide is divided into several sections. There's a meat, meat alternate section, a vegetable, a fruit, a grain, and a milk. We also have some appendix, which the appendix is really well done. And then we also have a section called other foods. Now at the top, so if you find something in the grain section, it's considered a grain. You'll find beans in the vegetable and the meat meat alternate because it can be used as a bean or as a vegetable. We have what's called other foods. We don't have a component called other foods. If you find something in the other food section, it and it will tell you in there, this is not creditable. It's not towards the reimbursable meal. But what happens is, is you may have a school district that serves rolls and they want to serve butter with those rolls and they are going to be serving 500 rolls that day. It has butter back there. It has things like cream cheese because it's stuff that you may want to serve with your items so kids will eat it, but they're, they're not creditable food items. So you can't use it as part of the reimbursable meal. We've seen cream cheese quite a bit the last couple of years. Cream cheese is not a cheese that we consider a fat. Bacon is back there. It's not considered anything. It's just an extra. So if you find anything in the other foods, it does not count for child nutrition. It's just extra items, but it lets you know how to purchase it um, to, in the amount that you are wanting. 
And that's why we also like my book for the food buying guide. That's why I say use the newest one out there because in my book, it has popcorn and other foods, but now popcorn is allowable. And the reason they're also always updating it, they're changing the formatting to where you can like change the serving sizes and stuff. But what's also neat is that periodically they'll change like popcorn was not, it, it was an extra and now it is considered a grain. But they also like, for instance, if you go into the food buying guide, uh, mandarin oranges are in there, but it's only in a number 10. No, it's only in pounds, but most of you do in number 10 cans. So we're waiting, like they'll periodically add stuff like that. Like what is the yield for a number 10 can? So that's why they update it frequently, but it's things like that. It may not be so much food that they're adding. Sometimes it is. Um, but if you sometimes have questions, like there's sometimes we did get a question this week, um, about dragon fruit. So dragon fruit is not in the food buying guide, but I cannot see USDA not allowing dragon fruit because it is a fruit. I mean, I could see more things on the meat side, some of the grain side, but not a fruit. So it's not in there. So we're going to reach out to USDA regarding that. So if there is something that you do want to, to purchase and you want to serve, especially like a fruit or a vegetable, and you cannot find it in the food buying guide, please contact us and we will see what we can find. Sometimes things are under a different name. Um, so that's why sometimes when you search, it can get a little bit hard, but make sure just reach out to us and we can see what we can do about that. Cause I would allow someone if they want to serve dragon fruit I would say go for it because it's something very it's something that they won't get all the time um so again this is the food buying guide we talked about the yield tables so if you do want to go if you go into the app version or if you go into the online version and you want to look at it where it looks just like the book click on in the app version click view yield tables and if you're in the online version click on the pdf version and it will show you the hard copy you can print it off you can save it but it will also look exactly like the main book if you want to do that. So this is the book. The book is pretty colorful. This is the hard copy. Again, you see the fruit is purchase column right here at the front. And I'm going to talk to you about how to read the food buying guide. So this is ground beef because I think every entity does serve ground beef. So as you can see here, we have ground beef, fresh or frozen, 24% fat, 20% fat, 15% fat, and 10% fat. So the most common is 80-20. As we mentioned earlier, if you are not aware, but one pound equals 16 ounces, always. So no matter what it is, if it's a pound, it's gonna be 16 ounces. So in this case, we're gonna take the ground beef. Um, if we were to serve it or cook it per pound, one pound, which is 16 ounces, when you cook 80-20 ground beef, will give you 11.8 one ounces of cooked lean meat. And the reason for that is because of the fat content. If you look here, um, if you go down, here's the 1585. It gives 12 um, one ounce cooked lean meat. If you do ground beef 9010, it will give you 12.10 one ounces of cooked lean meat. It does consider the fat in there. I have a cousin who he's younger. And he was telling me he watches this TikTok of this guy who always goes to restaurants and orders a steak and he takes a scale with him. So he would order, he goes, it never matched up to what they said. So if he said he ordered a six ounce steak, when he got it, it was never six ounces. Well, that's because of the fat content. When you cook it, it shrinks it down. And the more fat that's in it, um, the more it's going to shrink. So if you go to a restaurant and you get a 12 ounce ribeye or a 12 ounce filet, which would be absolutely huge. Um, when she, once they cook them, they're both going to shrink down but the ribeye is going to shrink down a lot more than that filet um, just because of the fat content in it. So when you see things like that, when they when you purchase it, you are purchasing whatever they're stating. But when you get it, it may not be the full amount because of how it shrinks down due to um, the fat. Now, in this column five, especially if you're a large center or a school, if you need 100 servings, so if you need 100 one ounces of servings of cooked ground beef, then you need to cook 8.5 pounds. And then this is just additional information right here. Now, throughout the food buying guide, um, in the manual, in the hard copy, you'll have a white section and a gray section. So this gray section right here, what this is, is it's again, it's per pound, but per pound, they're saying you get 7.89. This one's 11.8, one ounces of cooked lean meat. This one is 7.89, one and a half ounces of cooked lean meat. You might be a Head Start program and all you have is three to five-year-olds and you do nothing but cook for um, one to 
three to five year olds that need one and a half ounces of cooked lean meat. So they give us, they always give a second option all throughout the manual. So in the manual, one will be the white section and one is of a great section. Now, when you do get to the app and when you get to the online version, they have, they kind of list them on top of each other. The top one is usually going to be the white version. The white version to me is mostly, it's the most common, um, but they do have another, and it's that way throughout. Um, we have the fruit and vegetable section right here. So this one is, is whole green beans, whole, and it also includes USDA foods. So when I talked about a turkey roast, yeah, I, I, so in schools, you can do a turkey roast if you want to serve that as a lunch meat. And it specifically states in the food buying guide, um, it says, uh, turkey roast USDA foods only. So this one says it includes USDA foods, but if it says USDA foods only, it's only if you get that product from USDA foods. So it's kind of interesting how it does say, but if you do get commodities, um, you can also include that into this category. But again, we're talking about whole green beans. As you can see here, we have flat green Italian whole, canned we have flat italian frozen whole and then we have green beans cut and that includes usda so it, you really have to find the exact product that you are serving but up here we're doing the whole green beans and we have the number 10 can and it says a number 10 can will give you 39.5 one fourth cup heated drained now this right here in the online version and in the app, you can change this to a half of a cup, a cup, an eighth of a cup, three fourths of a cup. You can change it whatever you need to. Maybe you're doing snack and you wanna serve green beans for snack and you can change this to three fourths cup and that will give you the correct serving size for everybody. Now this right here, again, if you need 100 one fourth cup servings, it will tell you you need 2.6. So if you change this to a half of a cup, it would change this amount, how much per, um, number 10 can, it would be less because it would change this from a fourth of a cup to a half of a cup. And then it would also change this. It would double this amount if you change this from a fourth of a cup to a half of a cup. So it really is, does some neat things if you go, if you use the app or the online version. So again, right here, as you can see, it gives you two, we have the white version and the gray version. So this, if it's heated. So if you have a number 10 can, you'll get one fourth cups heated. Now, maybe you're doing a three bean salad and it's gonna be um, in the refrigerator and it's not gonna be heated. So it tells you that this number 10 can will give you 52.2 one fourth cups drained. So one is heated and one is not heated. So that's the big difference because again, when you heat something, it plumps it up. So it has, it gives you yes, less yield where when you have less, it shrinks it down so you can get more out of the container. So that is why this book is very important. So if you, if we come to your center or to your school and you're say you're serving green beans for lunch, we're going to use this one, assuming that you're heating it. You do need to let us know if you're not heating it if you're just opening up the can and serving it, because it does give you two different sizes. And if you're doing this one down here and we base it off of this one up here, we there's a good chance we would take meals back because we didn't think you served enough. So we're gonna assume you've heated green beans up for lunch, but if you do not, you need to let us know. So now we have the app. So all you have to do is go into either the iTunes or if you go into Google Play and you just type in USDA uh, food buying guide and it will pull up an app. A lot of us consultants use it because we don't have to lug around the big manual. And I know there's 2,100 food items in the food buying guide and you're only using a small fraction of them because there's items in there like tripe and ostrich, venison. There's all kinds of foods that you can serve in there. Um, and like I said, there's other foods that you can't find like dragon fruit we haven't been able to find. So what I did is I opened up the app and I typed in ground beef. And as you can see here, it says ground beef, 30% uh, fat. So this is the 70, 30, 70, 30. There's two of them in here. Again, this one would be like the, the version in the white, and this is the gray version. So you're going to see multiple. So more than likely, you're going to want to click on the top one, um, unless you kind of do things a little bit different. Um, you'll want to click on the second one, but it does give you both options. It's just they're in two separate formats. So I did the normal one that we went to. I went to 80, 20 ground beef. I clicked on the first one, not the second one, because I wanted the white version where it does the one ounce, not the one and a half ounces. And it gives it gives us the category, the subcategory. Um, again, it's beef, ground, fresh or frozen. And then um, the purchase unit is by pound. It gives me 11.8, one ounce cooked lean meat. Again, it tells me I have to cook 8.5 
pounds to get 100 one ounce servings, and then a little bit of additional information. Now, right here where it says select, you can click on that and that's where you can compare the item or you can add it to your favorites. Maybe you wanna share something with somebody, you're also allowed to share the item. It's pretty cool. The app is pretty cool. So now let's go to the online version. So this is the one that you can just literally, this is what we do a lot too, is we just Google. Like if I was at a center or a school working, a lot of times if my computer's already up, I'm gonna go ahead and just use my food buying guide online. Once you get in there, so like I stated before, you can log in, I go in as a guest and I just put that I'm a state agency person, but this is what it looks like when you get in there, you have the homepage. So if you click on home, you can download the food buying guide. So it'll be the PDF version. There's a resource center. Um, then you can also do meal components. You can look up something. So if you know for sure it's like a cheese or you know it's a meat meat alternate, you can click on meat meat alternate and go there. Um, there's the food items. If you click food items, you can hit search. Or if you do have stuff listed in your favorites, you can just click on your favorites tab and it will go ahead and pull all your favorites up for you. Then you can go to tools. Uh, oh no, I'm sorry, this is in help. There's the appendix as well and there's tools. So you can click on those, I don't go through them. But with help, you can do the food buying guide calculator. You can do a shopping list. So if you know how much that you need to purchase, you can create your own shopping list. There's also a training video that you can use. And if you do have questions actually about the food buying guide, let's say you want dragon fruit and you don't see it in there, you can contact you you can contact them that does the food buying guide directly and they are frequently asked questions or you can contact them and say hey i don't see dragon fruit do you have any yield for that and then they can be able to give you that information so if you want to navigate going through so what i did is i always go to food items so this is when i went to food items and then i hit food item search and then I just typed in, um, you can reset it if you need to, um, but again, you can just type in your keyword that you want, and you can also um, narrow it down to the meal component. We just did all meal components, but you can put vegetable, fruit, you can do whatever you want to do there. So I did green beans again. This is just cut green beans. Again, this actually gives you all this information without clicking on it. You can click on the footnotes. I will say there's a lot of footnotes in here, so you can click on the footnotes. You can find the information just right here. You can compare it by clicking add, or again, you can add this to your favorites. So again, this actually gives me all the information I would need, um, but I did choose to click on it. And when you click on it, it, this looks a little distorted, but it will tell you again, it's green beans cut the number 300 can, which is a 15 ounce can, it will give you five one fourth cup heated servings. You would need 20 of these if you need 100 one fourth cup servings. And again, just here's the initial footnotes. It does let you know that this is an other vegetable for school districts. It's not considered a dark green. So there are some newer features to the food buying guide. Um, you can select the desired serving size per meal contribution. Again, for the fruits and vegetable, you can change it from a fourth of a cup to a half of a cup. Again, that's also in the web-based tool and in the mobile app. Um, in the mobile app, you, again, you, if you have a, a, a um, iPad or anything like that, it's good for any of those. Um, you can do utilize grain. So there's method C in the recipe analysis workbook to determine the ounce equivalent grain contribution for all items listed in exhibit A. And then you can create copies of saved shopping list in the exhibit A grains items on the mobile app and in the webs in the web on the interactive tool. So we also have some just a little bit of additional information. So this is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite things. This is what I wanted to talk to you about. We did not have this in the food buying guide training and then we added it because it's re it's really for CACFP. It is more restrictive. Schools can do more than what is listed in this book. But you can find this, we have it in the resource library under the meal pattern section. Schools, we put this in there as well for you. It's in other documents under the food buying guide section. We did put an info sheet on there. So there's things that this is what says for CACFP, but there are some things that you can do. Like they're not allowed to serve a grain-based dessert, which is like a cookie, but you can. And it will say that in there, like, no, this cannot be served because it's a, it's a grain-based dessert. But if it says it's a grain-based dessert, schools can do that. So you can use this. I call this the Cliff Notes version of the food buying guide because it's just a fabulous book. So again, it is broken up in all the component sections. And this happens to be the meat meat alternate section. 
So let's just say you're here and you're like, hey, can I serve bologna as a meat need alternate? And it will tell you maybe. And then it gives you information. It says if it's free of byproducts, cereals, or extenders. And when it if it also has a C and label or a product formulation statement, it tells you what some of the binders are and what the extenders are um, or byproducts. And it also tells you where to go in the food buying guide. So if it's just regular bologna, it will have by it will have byproducts in it and extenders. Um, if you use all beef bologna or all beef hot dogs, those don't have the extenders, binders, or um, uh, cereals in it. So that's why you're allowed to serve those. Um, so also, let's just say you wanted to serve beef jerky as a snack. Can you serve beef jerky? And this is for all meals, not just for like snack or. But let's just say beef jerky more commonly. If you wanted to serve it, be it snack. Can you serve it? And it says no, and it tells you why. So it's a really, really good, I call it the Cliff Notes version because it just lets you know, first of all, can you serve it, can you not? It says yes, no, maybe. And then it lets you, gives you more additional information. So these are just some common meat need alternates, and this is the serving size, just as kind of a cheat sheet. So if you want to serve peanut butter, two tablespoons equal one ounce. If you want to serve yogurt, four ounces equal one ounce. Um, natural cheese, real cheese, one ounce equals one ounce. So again, these are just some helpful hints to help you if you do want to serve. So if you also want to serve beans as a meat meat alternate, this is how much you have to serve for it to equal one ounce or two ounces. And just as always, as a reminder, beans are considered considered a meat and they're also considered a vegetable, but you cannot have them as a vegetable and a meat in the same meal. You have to decide which one it's going to be. So using the crediting handbook, what I do love is you have things like this, which is imitation cheese or cheese product. Cheese products are those cheeses that melt really well. It says it here, this is in the meat meat alternate section. Can you serve it? And it says no, and it tells you why you cannot serve it. Again, this is for all child nutrition programs. I don't go really a lot into the grains because that's where it differs is the grains for CACFP and for the schools. Also there's sugar requirements for yogurt, which the schools do not have as well. So again, it may say that you might be able to serve a yogurt, but it just depends on the sugar amount, which again, that does not apply to schools. We see this one quite a bit as well. We see potato chips or veggie chips and it says are these credible and it's no potato chips and other vegetable chips contain different variations if you do want to serve a chip you can serve either those that are potato or not potato i'm sorry if it starts with a corn or flour um that's what you can serve so you can serve like corn chips doritos cheetos fritos sun chips and then flour, uh, flour or tortilla chips. Anything that starts with a flour or a grain or corn, and corn is considered a grain. So if you serve those chips, it doesn't count as a vegetable, it counts as a grain item. This also gives very helpful hints about what is like an average size banana and an average size orange. And I'm not talking about the Mandarin, the normal size orange. If you serve an average size medium, it will give you a half of a cup. It's because of all the peeling on there. If you serve an apple, about one medium size apple is one cup. Again, it's just, this is so good with helpful hints. And especially if you have new staff, um, it just, it's very helpful. Can we serve this? Can we not serve it? And it's a great book for them to start using to see if they are are able to serve it or not. Now, the, if you do fruits and vegetables, so if you do raw leafy, so if you want to do like anything, raw leafy, salad, spinach, anything like that, you have to serve double to equal. So if you want to serve a cup, it will equal a half a cup. And if you think about it, if you take spinach and you microwave it down, it shrinks up a lot. I just say it's so fluffy. You have to serve double of what you want it to credit as. If you do anything dried, like a dried fruit, um, like a raisin, it's, it's dehydrated, so it shrank. So if you were to reconstitute it, it was plump up. So if you serve a fourth of a cup of raisins, cranberries, if you serve a fourth of a cup, it would actually equal a half of a cup. So you actually get more yield out of dried fruit. So the food buying guide, I, like I mentioned before, we use it during our reviews. Do not depend on the label to get your serving size that you need. Again, the food buying guide takes in consideration if it's heated, if it has juice, fat, all of that information it, that doesn't tell you on the back of the, of the can, whether like if it's a like that yields this if you heat it, it yields this if you don't. Um, the food buying guide is also an average. So what I was told how they came up with the food buying guide is they took, so we use the number 10 can of whole green beans. So what they did is they took 10 different brands and then what they did is they scooped it out. They heated it, scooped it out 
And then um, that was the average of 10 different brands. Cause they do understand maybe what you have might give you a little bit more yield than what somebody else's. So it's just an average and it just keeps it consistent. So some other homemade alternatives. So we talked about the food buying guide. We talked about CN labels, but some people are like, you know, I can't find CN labeled products. So we state you can always make something homemade and create a standardized recipe. So you can have pigs in a blanket instead of corn dogs. You can make your own bean burritos. Instead of buying them pre-made, you can just get refried beans, put cheese in there, roll them up and heat them. You can make your own chicken tenders with shake and bake or anything else. The breading wouldn't count, but you can at least tell us how much meat meat alternate was in there. You can make your own pizza, biscuit dough, bagels, you can use by the pre-made crust because you know how much meat you're putting on there. Cheese, you can tell us how much bread is on there. And you can also make your own breads. And these are just some examples. There's a lot more that you can do. You can make your own pizza sticks. You can buy bread sticks, put cheese on top, melt it, and then put serve it with marinara. So again, these are just some suggestions. Instead of not having stuff with a C and label, you can make your own. And standardized recipes, just so you're aware, if you make anything that has more than one ingredient, you have to have a recipe for that. Um, if you're using a recipe already created, maybe you're using a lot of USDA recipes, you can make alterations to the recipe. It does need to be on the recipe though, so we can see what those alterations were. And we do say if you do make alterations, especially to any USDA recipe, is to be very cautious. Do not change the meat meat alternate, grain, fruit, or vegetable. Um, you can play with the spices. Maybe you can add more of anything, but it's going to mess with the um, serving. So like with here, this is a USDA recipe, and it states if you serve this recipe and use one cup, it provides two and a fourth ounce equivalent meat meat alternate and one and a fourth ounce equivalent of grain. So that's what's great about the USDA recipes is they, they tell you the recipe and then they tell you how to cook it and prepare it. And that way, you know, everybody's getting enough. This is an example of chicken alfredo with a twist. This is a USDA recipe. This is from a child care. A lot of the daycare and school recipes are the same. A lot of times what's different is the serving sizes right here is one is for 25 servings, one's for 50. School recipes tend to be, I think, for 100 or 200 or 50 and 100. I can't quite remember. But like right here, their kids don't like rotini. So instead of doing rotini pasta, they changed it out for spaghetti noodles, but they kept it the four pounds. Um, they don't use white ground pepper they just use regular pepper so they mark that out and then their kids don't like as much pepper so they did one teaspoon of pepper and then they but their kids really like garlic powder so they doubled the garlic powder so see you can make changes to the recipe just indicate it on the recipe and not just that if you're out and you can't cook that day and you know how the kids like it and then someone cooks this and uses the recipe just as is and the kid they're like the kids don't like it you want to make the recipe to where the kids like it and will eat it so you can make any alterations you need to. Another thing about USDA, you can get some USDA standardized recipes. Um, we have the team nutrition, which we re we've been re recruiting for a long time. We have the child nutrition recipe box, which we found is new. And then we also have healthy school recipes and daycares. Again, you can use some of the things, but if it's a dessert type item, you probably cannot do it, but you can use a lot of the recipes out, out here as well. I will tell you about this healthy school recipes. I found it by default. Another one of our consultants specialists found it by default as well. This healthy recipe school box is so cool. So you can go in there and it has recipes from school districts and it also has recipes from USDA. But what I like about it is I was in there looking at a spaghetti recipe, a USDA spaghetti recipe, and I clicked on it. And when I printed it out, it was like for 100 servings. I needed it for 475. So it let me change it from 100 to 475. And when I did that, it changed the whole recipe for me. So it let me know how much to prepare, how much I had to cook. Um, it, so I didn't have to do the math. It is phenomenal. If you're a school district and you have a recipe that you really like and you want, they will, you can submit it to them and they will standardize the recipe for you. When they standardize the recipe, they will also put it on the website and make it available to any other school district that wants to use it. So this is not just school recipe. I mean, it's not just USDA recipes. There's school recipe as well for that. Um, I don't know of any place you can actually purchase recipes. They're all just online anymore. If you just click to these links and you can just click on them and then print the ones that you want out. We haven't seen anything that you can just do a, a, a recipe book like they used to do. Um, but you can go through and see what you might want to do and what you may not want to do. Um, but 
it's just really, really cool. We've asked, got that question a lot, but we can't, like we've searched for it and we cannot find a recipe book. You may try Team Nutrition. They might have one and they will probably mail you one for free, but we're just, we have been looking and we can't find them. And plus like with USDA recipes, they're adding new ones all the time. And then some of these also has school recipes as well. Um, the Child Nutrition Recipe Box and Team Nutrition have both CACFP and school recipes, but the Healthy School is really mostly just for schools, but daycares, you can use it as well. Um, but go in there. They have some really cool recipes that some schools are doing across the nation. Well, that is um, the food buying guide for today. I do want to let you know if you have any questions um, to go into the manual. Uh, I need to update this pages. I just got finished with the school, with the daycare manuals. So um, call your consultant, call your program specialist. We've changed their name. If you have any questions, um, again, your specialist, especially if you have a product formulation statement, if you have questions about your CN labels, if you have questions about some food items you want to purchase, definitely contact them if you're not finding it in the food buying guide. And like I said, I'm about to email the food buying guide myself regarding the dragon fruit because if people want to serve it and it's a fruit. I mean, dragon fruit's a fruit. So we just don't know what it yields, but I'm sure, I don't know if USDA is working on it. And I'm wondering if that's how they put products in here is based off people using it. So, you know, if you have mandarin oranges and in there right now is only by pound and you use a number 10 can, we need to let them know. So that way they can keep updating the food buying guide based on products. And a matter of fact, we were looking at it and talking about some products because they're even changing the sizes of cans like um you know there are some in here that says a 15 ounce can but you really can't find a 15 ounce can anymore you can only find a 14 and a half ounce can so that's why they're constantly changing the food buying guide so um thank you guys for being here with me today i hope you learned a lot of information about the food buying guide and um, this is one of my favorite things to teach about because the book has been um, very cool. This will be up on the OSDE Connect self-paced. Just give us a little bit of time. Um, we just took down the one for 2022. So we're putting up the 2023 one. Um, I'm going to make a little bit of changes just to, like they said, those page numbers to the slide. But this should probably be up there maybe in about a week. Um, but we will get this in OSD Connect for 2023. We just took down the one for 2022. So again, give us a week to send you out your certificates or make sure it's posted in the training calendar. We have stuff to do on the backside. Um, but thank you guys so much for being here. I'm going to um, be here to answer questions for a little bit, but you guys are free to go. I hope you guys have a wonderful day and a wonderful school year. And I hope you daycares are getting a little bit of a reprieve now that the kids are going back to school. So have a great, great year, and we will see you guys very soon. And also, I do do this training every other month. I've been doing this training every other month, so we do look for it because I do it every other month.